a lot of views from the Hill today. Let's bring in the Thursday MPs for the great partisan divides on today's hot issues. Karina Gould is a Liberal MP from Burlington. Shannon Stubbs is a Conservative MP from Central Alberta. Tracy Ramsey, an NDP MP from Southwestern Ontario. Welcome to you all. Thanks. The Elections Act rewrite. We just had the minister on. I'm trying to figure out if this opens the door to a whole lot of voter fraud, or is it is it eliminating uh, re unreasonable restrictions for voters to vote? Shannon. Well, as you know, the Fair Elections Act was based on 38 recommendations from the independent chief electoral officer. And, uh, you know, in the case of ID, I find that most Canadians agree that they should have ID to be able to identify who they are when they go to vote, just like you require ID for so many other things in daily life. And 39 options of ID seem to be appropriate for most Canadians. So I guess we will, we will see if there uh, ends up being a lack of confidence in the system. But, you know, the fairness of the last election is not in dispute. And the Liberals always love to talk about taking recommendations from experts and from independent nonpartisan uh, bodies. And so I would think they would want to abide by the 30 recommendations of mm -hmm. the Chief Electoral Officer, which were embodied in the previous legislation. Poor Pierre Polyev. He must be, like, curled up in a fetal position because <laughs> his act is being... I don't think he curls up in the fetal position too much. Right. Well, um, Tracy, uh, where's the NDP? on this one. Is this a good idea that they're done today or what? Of course, Don. This is something we've long advocated for. I mean, the Fair Elections Act was widely known in Canada as the Unfair Elections Act, and it really restricted a lot of people from the ability to uh, exercise their democratic right to vote. A lot of Indigenous people don't have addresses, don't have the capability to have traditional ID. People with persons living with disabilities, the same thing. A lot of seniors. There were a lot of people that were being left out by these regressive uh, pieces that were put in place. And one of those, of course, uh, was announced today, and that's allowing expats to vote again. Uh, so these are things that, uh, you know, we believe should happen and were very wrongheaded in the previous Conservative government. All right. I mean, we had your minister on, so I don't need a long answer from you, Karina, but, you know, I, I, the expats thing, a concern for you hearing people say, well, five years, they shouldn't throughout more than five years, they shouldn't have the right to vote? They've given that up? Uh, no. Oh. And I can say that I've actually spoken to a lot of people in my community who have now returned to Canada and are glad that they are going to be able to vote again, but also people who were living abroad and who are Canadians. I mean, one of your fundamental rights as a citizen is the right to the franchise and the right to vote. So I think this is very positive. We're talking about a million Canadians. Mm -hmm. One thing that I do want to mention, and, you know, it's saying that this is, a, I think this is a really important day for for democracy and ensuring that we are making elections as fair and as accessible as possible and repealing the, as Tracy mentioned, the Unfair Elections mm -hmm. Act or the problematic parts with it. But there's a couple of other initiatives that are really important. For example, the pre-voter registry. So getting 14 to 17 year olds already engaged in registration and getting them prepared so that when they are 18 and when they are able to vote, they don't have extra hurdles to go through. So really making it as easy as possible for people to get their vote out. Okay. So Don, I guess what I would say is since since the Fair Elections Act became law, the last election saw the highest voter turnout of any federal election since 1993. Yeah, they were voting against Yeah, Harper's I think that was reflective of the previous prime minister. It's reflective of the And in fact, it saw Act. particularly high turnout among Canadians 18 to 24, a 39% increase to 69% turnout yeah, among true. that demographic. Maybe we'll make it even that. higher. The highest, uh, the highest voter turnout that, right, in, among seniors. And in 27 out of 33 of the constituencies with uh, the, the highest First Nations populations that saw the highest turnout. This, those also saw but uh, I think the you, highest you turnout the nail above on the, the head national because average. they were voting the Conservatives but, uh, out. but I think the point is, the point is this, though. If the argument is being made that the Fair Elections Act has hindered or hampered people from being able to vote, the proof is actually in the turnout of the 2015 election. That's not true. We, we might have had, 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 had over a million Act, more people vote. And we had record voter vote. turnout, and that's something to we be celebrated. We might have had over a million more people vote had they had the ability right. to. So well, I think this is a really good thing, and as Tracy said, and as we're very proud of, and I'm sure the minister just said, that this means even more Canadians yes. are going to have a chance to I vote, just don't and see that's what's important. Anything on that list that they put out today, though, Shannon, that would prohibit voter, would would crimp the number of voters and change. Uh, what happened in 2015, do you? Well, I guess we'll see and debate the details of, those, of their legislation, okay. hopefully if they yeah. allow us to and debate the such an important thing. But is that I, we've... I think it is really important to note those facts about the last election True. that took place after the Fair Elections Act. It was a very well. well attended election. Until we're well, 100%, the space, we're, the we're near where we need to be. Why. Well, <laughs> if you get mandatory <laughs> voting. voting. Yeah, if you get absolutely. mandatory voting. Well, let's move along to...
It's been going on for days now. The Trudeau uh, fundraising ruckus. Uh, the only development today that was kind of interesting was Chuck Straw, former mm -hmm. MP, uh, backed away from the Trudeau Foundation. He said, look, I don't want to be part of this political football. I'm getting out of this foundation. It's a, it's a charity foundation. And the prime minister did come out today and basically say, you know, I've been away from that for, for some time, although I think he was there a couple of three years ago. But anyway, Shannon, like, why is this? Why are you keeping this up? I mean, is, is, are you sensing, you're smelling blood here? I mean, is there a, a real case of conflict here? What's the problem? The problem is that it is in contravention of the expectations set by the Prime Minister and by the Liberal Party. Mm -hmm. So in the Prime Minister's guidelines of, of op openness and accountability to his cabinet, he said there should not be preferential access or the appearance of prefer preferential access right. for uh, to government. The Liberal Party's guidelines say that um, for, for businesses or corporations who are doing business with government, they should not be invited to attend fundraisers. Right. The Liberals constantly talk about how the political fundraising laws in Canada are the most stringent, the strongest, the most accountable in uh, in the world. We would agree with that because, of course, it was the previous Conservative government yeah. who passed those laws. But this is just yet another example of the cavernous, a cavernous gap between what the Liberals say, what they promise, and mm. then what they he's actually do. He's not breaking do. the law, though. You'll admit that much, right? He's, he's bending his own guidelines or at most. And this is about his ability right. to keep and to enforce his own own words and for the Liberals to uphold what they say and what they promise right. to Canadians. Tracy, is there anything new today or is this just we're t chasing the tails here? Well, this is new. I mean, this is someone who is in a high, pro uh, high profile position who's saying, I'm going to remove myself from here before things get really bad, before, you know, the lights get turned on and everyone sees what's really been going on. So I think there is uh, a serious uh, issue that's happening and we're very unhappy to be seeing the Liberals setting these rules for themselves and breaking them, pointing fingers at the Conservatives, saying, right. well, they did it, so we're doing it. These are ridiculous arguments. Canadians are sick and tired of this type of uh, spending. And, you know, to throw it back at regular MPs, we are ministers of the crown. Mm -hmm. We are not the prime minister. The prime minister and ministers of the crown in our country are held to a high regard, a high esteem. I, I believe that initially when Justin Trudeau put out this mandate and saying that they would actually hold themselves above what the law was, uh, they, you know, hopefully thought they would achieve that, but here they are breaking that over and over and over. They've been called unsavory by Mary Dawson. Yeah, the that's pretty hard to do. Okay, yeah. quick one from you, Karina. I mean, you've seen this thing unfolding. Why doesn't why doesn't the Liberal Party just follow Kathleen Wynne's example in Ontario and say, we're not going to do this anymore, we're going to outlaw them? Well, I mean, yes. Kathleen Wynne is outlawing fundraising for all parties all, all and all politicians. MGPs, yeah. So yes. is that what you guys are advocating as well? She's doing to no, individuals. At, yeah, no, but to no, individuals, I'm, for all MPs, this right? This is a classic yeah, and so, liberal evasion of no, being yeah. accountable for Do you think themselves. it's a good idea? I, yes. I think that we do the do what about the minister's right? guidelines for right? the liberals? But as you mentioned, Don, no laws have been broken, right? I think that's a really that's important, important that's that's a really important <laughs> uh, point and fact to make, anyway. right? Yeah. Because we do have really strict fundraising laws, and we are abiding by those. And I think it it is important that we keep upholding that, <laughs> and that all politicians do, and that we recognize that we have a strict fundraising environment in this country, and that we continue to follow yeah, well, that. Don, you know that doesn't fly with is average is Canadians. Yes, Kathy, that argument doesn't fly with saying. average Canadians yeah. when yeah. we're talking. About about this type I mean, of the donation right. kind of really complicated to the sure. to the foundation. I mean, I know that but wasn't. We, but I we know also that's not the know party. that the yeah that this is a separate foundation yeah. that's independent that provides funding for social and humanitarian and humanities research, right? That does really good work. They provide scholarships yeah. for the Trudeau okay. scholars. Uh, I mean, this is something that's completely separate, and Weird. I think it's important that you know, as a government, we support research and we support independent charities to develop their own right. fundraising or to time. follow fundraising laws I want to talk about an issue that's going to affect a lot, a lot of people in a bad way, but it doesn't apply to the whole country yet. Um, John Tory, the mayor of Toronto, announced today toll roads, and here's, here's a clip of what he had to say. Traffic is a growing nightmare, and the number one fix is to give people more transit options so they can get out of their cars. If we're going to tame the traffic beast, especially in light of our expected growth, it means starting to collect funds today or shortly after today for crucially needed transit for tomorrow. So basically they're going to charge Torontonians to sit in gridlock for 
hours on the Don Valley Parkway and the Gardner Expressway. Uh, but the, the key here for the federal government is the Liberals have started an infrastructure bank that will partner with private interests. And I guess the concern is that toll roads would come to a city near you. Is that of what your course. concern is as the NDP? I, I don't think it's just our concern. It's Canadians' concerns. But, you know, the NDP is clearly saying that if we're going to private investors, they want a return on their money. How are they going to get that return on their money? It's going to have to come from somewhere. So if it's a toll or if it's user fees, that's going to come right out of the pockets. Essentially, Canadians are going to be double taxed. They're paying to have public infrastructure. Now they're going to be paying again so that they can have private corporations investing in that infrastructure. Okay. And this is not what the Liberals campaigned on. Okay. They campaigned on borrowing because we have low interest rates uh, to infuse our country with jobs and infrastructure projects. Now what's going to happen? You know, we have private corporations that are coming in. Are we going to have Canadians employed? Are private corporations going to dictate who's working on those sites? What, what is the impact going to be? And ultimately, we're all paying for that. Good this questions. Is, Shannon, where are you on this one? Is it a good idea to start letting some tolls go on some of these roads to pay for transit? Well, that decision ultimately is up to Mayor Tory and the council and mm -hmm. up to Torontonians and Ontarians um, to, to decide. But I think what's really at issue here is we've got an astronomical deficit, three times what the Prime Minister said it would be. Much of that is billions of dollars in infrastructure spending, which they said would, uh, would create jobs mm -hmm. and grow the economy. And in fact, more jobs have been lost than created in the past year. And 99% of infrastructure projects are not under construction. Okay, we're out of time, but give me your last thoughts on this one. Uh, <laughs> Well, as a Liberal, I'm going to try to bring this back to reality because I think we've had some sensationalist <laughs> comments on both sides here. But the fact of the matter is, is that we have an infrastructure gap in this country. Our government is committed to investing $180 billion over the next 12 years. Right. We understand that this is a decision that Toronto is taking. We support local decision making and local leadership because we know that there are significant gaps in terms of public transit and other infrastructure areas in this country and our government is committed to working with provinces right. and municipalities. But no local decision making on the carbon tax. Okay. That was a cheap shot. All right. Thank, thank you. That was a segue and a half. All right. Thank you. It was great having you three on. We'll see you next week. Thanks. All right.